The Home Tech Podcast is supported by our listeners. To learn more, visit hometech.fm slash support. This is the Home Tech Podcast for Friday, March 16th, 2018. From Sarasota, Florida, I'm Seth Johnson. And from the mile-high city of Denver, Colorado, I'm Jason Griffin. Seth, how's it going? Great, great, man. Uh, I'm just sitting here uh, looking around. Tee-hee. Oh, what, what the heck was that? What? Tee-hee. What was that? Tee-hee. What? Tee-hee. <laughs> <laughs> it's not creepy at all. Why is a little laughing at me? <laughs> is that really the laugh? Wow, that is creepy. I think I heard a different one online. Anyways. I don't know. I, I asked it to do it today, and that's that's what it came out with. So <laughs> That's what you got? Well, you had to use specific language, right? Because uh, they had a weird glitch. For those of you not really uh, you know, scratching your head maybe and wondering what the heck we're, we're talking about here, Alexa had a little bit of a... A glitch this week, and a number of people r- reported uh, hearing these sort of creepy laughs uh, out of nowhere, which would be uh, a bit uh, a bit of a surprise. And it turns out that, uh, according to Amazon, in rare circumstances, Alexa can mistakenly hear the phrase "Alexa laugh." Uh, Seth, you're going to have a number of bleeps and posts there. Uh, the company. <laughs> The company did say in a statement to GeekWire, we are changing the phrase to Alexa, can you laugh, which is less likely to have false positives, and we are disabling the short utterance, Alexa, laugh. So there you go. Mystery solved. (laughs) Yeah, that's... uh... I was, I was actually at Disney when that hit, and I'm like, oh, man, I, was, I wish I was home when the, to try this out. Uh, but uh, I wasn't able to give it a shot until I got back and um, decided to, to see if I could record it. But, man, that that's hilarious. Like, I, I have been victim to the um, the stupid Echo losing power at the, in the middle. I, I think they fixed this. Um, when I initially got the Echo, uh, if it shut down in the middle of the night, I would it would wake up and, and kind of do this weird hello sound that it, I remember you saying that. I remember you telling me about that. And, and I, I think <laughs> they got wise to it after a while. It's, it stopped doing that if it, if we lost power in the middle of the night, um, but it still does do it. I think during the day, like, so, so uh, it, right. that, that's a smart iteration that they were able to pull off. But I, I do remember just waking up in the middle of the night and hearing hello and just, Oh my God, that, that, if that doesn't freak you out, um, <laughs> uh, this, you know, the laugh doesn't freak you out. That, that'll do it. So yeah, a little, a little weird for sure. <laughs> and you know what the best part is though? We've got a new sound effect now, yep. uh, for, for the sound bank there, which, uh, which you've got set up for the live show now. So, uh, you know, there's some positive out of it. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Maybe I'll use that to bleep the, uh, bleep the, the word this time. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, Seth. Well, uh, yeah, let, let's jump into some, some headlines here. I think you're up first. Samsung just unveiled its 2018 lineup for QLED, not to be confused with OLED. Uh, Those are the quantum dot, I guess is what they're using. Uh, These are their new 4K TVs. A major focus in the lineup is intelligence and smart home control. The new QLEDs will ship with Bigsby uh, and offer voice assistance capabilities right out of the box. And they also act as a centralized dashboard for Samsung SmartThings smart home platform, giving you on-screen control over all things smart things. Very interesting. I know that uh, we did hear uh, that Samsung was going to be doing that with uh, with the smart things integration a while back. And and hey, look, it's a Bixby sighting. Yay. So maybe maybe we're getting closer. We'll we'll have to uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that one. Uh, moving on here, Monday of this week was your last day to get YouTube TV for $35 a month. Uh, the price has now increased to $40 a month, putting it more in line with services such as Hulu and Sony's PlayStation View. Google announced the price increase last month as it has added a number of new channels, including TNT, TBS, Cartoon Network, and CNN. It's those expensive bubble guppies. That's it, man. Philips announced a new outdoor version of their popular Hue smart lighting system. The products work seamlessly with the existing Hue systems and will come equipped with white and the white color ambience lamps. The Hue Lily, which will sell in a kit with three light points for $280, is a spotlight system that you can use to highlight your garden. If you need color changing pathway lights, the Hue Kala Bullard will run you $130. Several other products in the white-only category were announced, starting as low as $50. Uh, We don't have too many details on those other than their names. And the new lights will be available in the U.S. this summer. Other than the names, and those are not easy ones to pronounce, Seth, so I'm glad that story came to you first. Nice job. I took them out. (laughs) Yeah, good, good. Uh, Yeah, I did read that they're having a press conference, I think, uh, this coming Monday, 
uh, to reveal more information. I definitely have some questions about this, specifically around uh, RF range and how that's going to perform outdoors. And uh, presumably, I guess you'll need some strong uh, Wi-Fi out there, I suppose. I, I actually am not sure. Uh, Hue is a Zigbee, is a Zigbee system, yeah. right? So anyways, definitely some unanswered questions for me there. I was digging around a little bit and was unable to find it. So we'll look forward to learning more about that one soon. Uh, moving on to our next quick story here. Reports are circulating that Apple could be releasing another version of the HomePod later in 2018 at a significantly lower price point than the current model. Uh, this, according to a report from KGI's Ming-Chi Kuo. How'd I do there, Seth? Great. Nice. <laughs> Nailed it. I practiced before. Uh, there, <laughs> According to uh, Ming-Chi Kuo, there will be a cheap version of the HomePod in the second half of this year. So we'll see. Yep, hopefully we'll we'll see that. Hopefully they'll update uh, HomePod altogether. I mean, it's it it it's got anywhere to go but up. So, so um, a smart things outage this week left many users unable to control their connected lights, locks, and other hardware. Reports of the problems began to circulate on Monday, March 12. Smart Things acknowledged the outage that afternoon and addressed it by Monday evening. Uh, though a small subset of its users then continued to struggle to install and edit automations on the platform. I checked their website and they still kind of had some like updates to do, but everything's green. So I'm not sure. Uh, it may just be a couple of people still having problems. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. It's hard to tell, but it sounds like it was a pretty uh, widespread outage. I know Gavin Campbell, who we had uh, on the show, is a big Smart Things user and um, was was thinking about him when that happened and, and some of the conversation we had when he was on the show recently about some of the reliability issues that smart things has had lately. So hopefully uh, they'll get things back on track there soon and that it didn't affect too many people uh, too badly. Speaking of that story here and our final quick headline, not to be outdone by smart things, the Legrand Intuity system has also been down uh, this one for nearly two weeks, according to some dealers, which is uh, a, a, a big, big problem. Uh, if you got an Intuity system in your home, uh, customers were sent an email blaming the outage on a move to a new cloud architecture that will quote uh, will better serve the Intuity program. Uh, no time frame commitment has been given on a resolution of the outage. Legrand is asking dealers to continue to postpone Intuity truck rolls and commissioning appointments while the issue is addressed. Uh, Legrand did commit to notifying dealers and homeowners with instructions on how to reconnect installed Intuity systems once testing of the new platform is complete. Do we have some sort of a fail uh, sound effect that we can tee up uh, there? You know, it's funny you ask. <laughs> there we go. That that rounds out that story. Yeah, that's that's incredible. I I have no words uh, to be to be completely down for that long and to have with no like with no indication of when you're going to come back yeah. either. Uh, I mean, can you imagine? Oh my gosh! <laughs> I, if I was a, a Intuity user, I would be fuming. Yep, yep, that is crazy. So hopefully they'll figure that out soon. That is a that is a bad bad deal right bad there. Bad situation for everybody involved. Yep. So uh, Eaglebee uh, has announced that it is closed on a sixty one million dollar Series C funding round led by Energy Impact Partners, so followed by several institutional funds, including the Amazon Electric Fund. Great. Now now I've got to bleep a fund. Uh, the, <laughs> the company says the funding will allow it to build upon its suite of smart home technologies connected by whole home voice control, sensor technology, and artificial intelligence. It brings Ecobee's total funding to approximately 146 million U.S. dollars to date. Yeah, so <clears throat> big, big round of funding there, and I know a lot of the uh, <clears throat> the headlines that I saw, of course, led with the fact that Amazon uh, was involved. Of course, um, this is the Amazon Alexa Fund, which. A little bit different than, you know, uh, I guess Amazon opening up their checkbook and, uh, you know, purchasing them or something like they did with Ring. But um, still interesting to see uh, Amazon's name in this story. And, and I, I think the broader story of Ecobee finding a lot of success and raising, you know, a whole bunch of money here, $146 million to date. Uh, there's there's some, you know, people making big bets on Ecobee. And, and I know that I have had great experience, Seth, with it here at my house. And um, generally a, a fan of the company. I've had a couple of, of instances where I needed a little bit of support figuring things out. The support was was really good. Um, I have nothing but, but good things to say about them. There was a, a second story that I want to tee up here. So big, big week for Ecobee. Uh, in addition to the funding news, 
Uh, they also officially announced pricing and availability for their new Switch Plus. Uh, this is a new smart switch available for pre-order now and shipping on March 26 for $99 in the U.S. and $119 in Canada. Uh, like other smart switches, the Switch Plus includes Alexa integration and HomeKit support, uh, but it also takes integration with Amazon's voice assistant a step further uh, by building it into the light switch itself. So big product release as well this week. Pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. I I, I was very excited about it. A um, l- little less so excited about it now that it's kind of come out and we've been you know, working with our developer relation person at Ecobee. There's not an API for it just yet. They're, they're, they're planning on bringing it, but... Uh, integrating this into other systems like professional systems, such as, you know, maybe Control 4 or Crestron or URC. Right. It's going to be a little bit tough until uh, we get that API brought to us. Uh, they they said they want to do it, but it's going to take them some time to to finish that off. And right now they're just focused on getting the product launched. Um, I, I kind of find this product funny, like going to their website and, and looking at it. Uh, <laughs> this thing has like uh, a little tiny speaker in it, right? And And it's talking about, Hey, you can listen to music out of your light switch. Uh, I don't know what to think about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, with all the the reviews that came out with you yeah. know with the Apple HomePod and how it how it sounded and all that that like this is gonna this is like the other end of the spectrum, right? Like you know this is gonna sound bad um, because it's a tiny little speaker inside of a light switch that you that you could yell at to well, do things. Right? L- look at it this way: there there is a speaker. Okay, and it does play music. Those things are true, right? So the marketing <laughs> team—they're team's not lying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the marketing team is is doing their thing there. I I get it. Yeah, that's going to sound uh, pretty pretty terrible, but you know the obviously the speaker's got to be there for that uh, for the Alexa functionality, and uh, it's an interesting looking product. I you know I, I frankly I don't think it's the most beautiful looking product I've ever seen, but it, it's not terrible, and certainly not. Um, Something I would hesitate to put in my own home if, if the need arose for it. I, I think that the the really thing that struck me about this story and one of the, one of the trends you know we mentioned one of the headlines Seth that we did a minute ago was, uh, Bixby integration into Samsung TVs, and now we're talking about Alexa integration into a light switch. And you know this is one of the the big themes that coming into the year I was really keeping an eye on, and it's already starting to take shape. This idea of voice control really propagating throughout the house. And and I really think that through the rest of 2018, we'll see more of that, right? You're going to see it breaking out of smartphones and stationary speakers and moving increasingly into other devices in the home, like light switches and TVs and eventually appliances. And pretty soon it's it's just going to become ubiquitous. And and you start to see why these companies are really competing to to own the platform. They're making the long play there because... uh, the you know the the speakers are just a that's just a conduit right to get to get that platform into the home. Yep, I, I mean there's there's definitely things I don't know if you can do this with um, these types of electric platform systems like, but I know on the the echoes you have like the ability to do intercoms between them like you can you can say drop in on oh, this yeah. particular room like this would make a really killer intercom system like if if that's if that's something you could do, you could just say, that's you know, a great idea. Yeah. Into, yeah. So I, I know that that would be, um, uh, I mean, imagine replacing all of those new tone systems and all those horrible, horrible, horrible <laughs> MS systems that are out there with yeah. this. You know? Yeah. Well, so that's interesting because echoes do have uh, echo to echo calling. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you know, that functionality is, is there at coming from the total non, technical of the two of us it's in the platform somewhere right yeah, yeah um and and it's just a matter of sort of figuring out how to implement it i, th- I think that's a a great idea i'd be surprised if they aren't sort of thinking it already i did a quick word search on this article while you were talking to see if intercom was in there and and it's not so no, who knows? I mean, they, they call it something else it, it, it's just oh, part they do of the it. echo system right so like it, i think it, you just get it if you get a lot but i don't know if you get it like I, I don't own any non Amazon branded Alexa products, so I don't really know right. if if it a hundred percent of Alexa gets transferred when you you know you stick her brain into a, a light switch, or you know you like with HomeKit <laughs> or with HomePod, like you get maybe ten percent of Siri stuck in there. So it will be interesting right. to to get that. Maybe somebody you know out there knows, um, they can give us some feedback. If you if maybe you can do that with your uh, if you have one of those EQB thermostats that has Alexa built in, and you can you know drop in to your thermostat somehow. Um, yeah, that, that'd be kind of interesting. It's an interesting use case that I thought of when I saw it. And I'm like, oh, you could do an intercom with this if it, if it works that way. And um, it, 
if if it doesn't, then I you know it's a miss, but I, it's definitely one of those things that Amazon can iterate on and make available. I'm sure yeah. for the rest of the partners on their platform. Well, I you know I I can say that I've heard anecdotally um, <clears throat> that Amazon and, and I, I was just searching to see if I could find any sort of stories, but you know I I think one of their big things with uh, with Alexa is that um, it's the same everywhere, right? Like they I I think have have as a company have gone to efforts to ensure that. Uh, there aren't all of these different flavors and and various iterations of of Alexa built into different devices. I, I think they're really trying as a company to keep it very consistent and uniform across uh, across all of the deployments. So uh, interesting. Here I found a just while we were talking, found a Reddit service. Uh, can Alexa drop in be enabled on the Eagle B four? Currently, no third party devices support drop in, which is a major bummer. Interesting. Yeah. So um, I'm hoping that's something that either gets this was done three months ago so you know who knows but i'm hoping that's we, something we get to see in the future because it, it's definitely a missing uh missing feature from this product perspective but not something that's a complete deal breaker if you're already interested in getting a light switch that you can talk to yeah it's, it's kind of a nice to have not a need to have but i yeah. i agree with you at the the form factor of this switch plus from ecobee is you know tailor-made for that sort of functionality, so drop in. That's that's right. I couldn't remember what it was called, but um, yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see if they're able to turn that on uh, at some point because uh, I think it would be a, a great fit. But like you said, I, I think it's a cool product uh, with or without it. Pretty compelling price point. It's it's. Uh, I know you can get smart switches certainly for cheaper than ninety nine dollars these days, um, but you know to to have some of the functionality built in that this one does. Uh, you know, it's it's a fairly compelling offering, so one one to keep an eye on for sure. Right. Well, uh, that wraps up our news section. To receive top headlines from last week in Home Tech, subscribe to our newsletter at hometech.fm. Definitely. So, Seth, we are going to move into our our feature here, and actually, for our feature, we're we're going to jump straight into the mailbag. We um, did a show last week for for anyone who may have missed it on. Uh, comparing mesh Wi-Fi systems. I personally am in the market for one. The Wi-Fi in my house is is pretty awful right now, and and am really going through and figuring out uh, you know what all the options are out there. And there's a ton of them, and I'm um, I'm ready to pull the trigger now. I, I, I Seth, as you and I were talking about before we came on air tonight, I I wanted to wait and see what sort of feedback we got from the show, and and we got a whole bunch of it. And I really appreciate everybody uh, who took a few minutes to reach out and let us know their opinions. And, and by and large, I got to say, Seth, that the the feedback was was generally very, very positive on uh, Eero as well as uh, as Orbi. Um, so we heard from a number of people on both of those. And uh, as our instincts on last week's show uh, sort of bared out, we were, I, I think, right in line with in, in terms of the market out there and a lot of people using those. They seem to be pretty popular solutions. So we got a lot of uh, really great input on that. Yeah, and I mean, I've got some, I've got a couple of bits of follow up uh, that we talked about last week. Um, first, my, my dad <laughs> called me and let me know that he uh, he did get the Orbi one, so he ended up with one of those. Uh, although he's funny, bo- both of our dads, yeah. <laughs> uh, bo- both of our dads have Orbies now, yeah. so he joined the Or Orbi Club. There you go. And I, I, you said you get two of those. It sounded like he had three of them. I really didn't get the full story because uh, it was just a quick discussion about it. But uh, he said that one of them he had some range issues. He, he was basically trying to get some of those ring uh, security camera lights installed. And those you have to have really good Wi-Fi to those devices or they won't work properly. So he was having problems getting one of those full on with the Wi-Fi. And he had to run a, um, he actually had to do a hardwire backhaul. This is what we're calling it now. Um, a hardwired networking cable from one into one of the other ones. Uh, so it would actually pick up and, and rebroadcast that Wi-Fi signal out to the uh, the ring device. Uh, once he did that, everything came up, works perfectly. He said he didn't really have any problems with it. He's, he said he's all covered now, but it just would not do, it would not connect wirelessly, I guess, to wherever he was trying to hmm. put it in. Was there like a a, a, a very big distance? Were, were these like spread across different sides of the property or something weird like that? Or was it just... You know, it's, a, it's an old home. So like it was a kind of like, built together in i think around 1900 and it's got mm-hmm. a metal tin like one of those metal roofs on it um i don't know like we, he, it's, he, a, it's a faraday cage yeah basically I, I, well and you know all the blinds are all metal those metal blinds that you you, you see like the two inch yeah. slat metal so like I, i'm sure 
everything in there doesn't help. <laughs> so, oh yeah, so. the environment is is a major impact, yeah. and the walls are probably plaster. I would imagine in a home uh, that old, unless it's been maybe redone or or something. So you know, I, I don't know in that area how how homes were built, but I know the older homes that we used to work in, like in Los Angeles, uh, were a- almost all lath and plaster, and and that stuff just you know it eats Wi Fi alive. Yeah. So. I think that's something that uh, a lot of people don't think about all the time, right? Is that the environment has a huge impact on on your Wi-Fi, and um, it, it can definitely make a big difference. So that's interesting to hear. Um, we got a couple of really interesting ones, and, and again, thank you everybody who reached out. We did want to call special attention to a couple of of the uh, uh, feedback, you know, some of the feedback that we got that was uh, uh, particularly interesting. So first, we had Robert Spivak, who is a you know, a longtime supporter of the show, and and Robert, thank you for for listening and and for providing this. He said, uh, made a cup, couple of points. He and I exchanged a a bit of a dialogue on on Slack over the weekend, and so I picked out a couple of the most salient points here. And he said, if you can hardwire the units uh, with a hardwired or Ethernet backhaul, uh, then first gen Eros are still a great buy uh, and function just as well. He said, lots of people are dumping them on eBay for a hundred dollars each or less. So you get some big savings. Um, I ended up sort of responding to that and saying, can you elaborate on that? Uh, you know, if you can hardwire them, what, what is the, what's the key difference there? And so he went on to explain that gen two added an extra radio. Uh, this is in the full unit Seth. So, you know, not the beacons that we talked about, uh, but in those full units, they added an extra radio, uh, so that you have three of them, meaning theoretically you can have a dedicated radio, uh, for backhaul with two radios still available, to serve clients. Uh, He did go on to point out, and you can tell Robert knows his way around a network here. He said, if you have a mixture of 2.4 and 5 gigahertz devices, uh, you know, that theoretically means no degradation in input. uh, But in reality, Eero dynamically chooses which radio to use as the backhaul. So you could end up with a single 2.4 gigahertz radio being used for backhaul because of distance or signal strength. And so client devices on the 2.4 would still be sharing the radio. Um, so pr- pretty deep there and hopefully easy enough to follow along. But basically, y- you know, the units are advertised as having that third radio as a dedicated backhaul. And in some instances, that's going to be true, but they're actually dynamically having to pick which radios to use. And so ultimately, you can actually end up with devices on that third radio. So point being, if you do have the ability to hardwire uh, and you're looking at Eero, uh, it sounds like picking up some cheap first-gen uh, units on on eBay or something might be a, a great place to look. Yeah, while you were while you were reading that, I I went to e- uh, eBay and and looked up and I found a lonely Eero Wi-Fi router that needs a home first gen, uh, only twenty bucks, right now. I mean, wow. like you, it's got five bids on it, so some yeah, time yeah. on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I I know I know for me, you know, like we talked about last week, I I don't have existing Ethernet cabling in the home, and definitely I'm not planning to run any right now. Um, so for me, I think the gen two, it sounds like maybe worth the extra money, um, versus picking up some gen one stuff, but, uh, really great advice again, for anybody who does have cabling and is looking at Eero, uh, that's, that's definitely something I would, I would take a hard look at. Yeah, absolutely. I I'm, I'm kind of getting, I have, I guess what would be the compliment to the second generation Eero, the Amplify by Ubiquiti. Um, it's there, it has the base station, which sits in the, um, sits in kind of like a closet where my equipment rack is. And then I have the two little paddles that go out, supposedly go out through the house. I have one in here, which is, uh, doesn't need to be in here. It's like five feet away from the, the actual router. And then I have one clear across the house in the master bed where I do actually need, you know, a little bit better Wi-Fi that from there. I mean, it, I could use a single, the single Amplify base station, uh, but I don't like, I, I, I have the rest of them. May as well use those little paddles uh, to get, the uh the signal relayed out um for whatever reason uh i have random not random outages but like random slowdowns of my internet service and when i just go and simply reboot the amplify router or sometimes i find it where it needs an update and i just update it and it reboots like everything works perfectly fine again so leads me to believe um, from years of deduction and troubleshooting that maybe there's <laughs> something wrong with yeah this one yeah that i have yeah. Don't need a troubleshooting degree uh, to start to connect those dots. I, I, I'm a, you know, it, 
it sounds like it's not a, a coincidence. I mean, if you're rebooting it and, and speeds are coming back, then, yeah. you know, where there's smoke, there's fire. But uh, presumably you've you've got a, a, a decent connection coming into the house and you sort of know that those hard, the, the speeds coming in th- from your ISP aren't dipping in correlation to when you're having those issues, presumably. No, they're oh, they're not because I'm not even rebooting the router. I'm just rebooting the, right. e- the, 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 the Amplify, which I'm using in bridge mode, which it's not even using the router portion of it. Uh, I reboot that everything kind of comes back up and works properly. So uh, I don't, I I'm, I'm just kind of like at my last straw with it, I suppose it's working fine right now. And it does get me good speeds when it does work. And it's only random. It's every once, every two or three weeks or months or, you know, it it doesn't happen very often when it does daily thing. You notice, you know, it's, it's yeah. 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 So I, it's kind of like taking a shower without hot water uh, you definitely notice <laughs> when you don't have hot water. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, if, if one day out of one random month you didn't have hot water, you'd probably remember that better than all the other days that you had hot water. So yeah. I, I, I'm probably yeah. going to get the uh, Ubiquiti, like the AC Pros that they have. Uh, maybe a couple. I only need two of those. Put those in the house. I have retrofitted a bunch of Cat5 in the house, so I, I have the option of putting those up somewhere. Um, and, and I should be able to locate one kind of in the master closet area and then one closer to the garage here. And, uh, that pretty much would cover the entire house. Yeah. Well, and that's a good choice for you. I mean, you've definitely, you, you've done a ton of those systems and, and you're going to be able to get in and, and, and knock out the configuration right away. It's a great system. I know a ton of people really love it. it. It's a little more work to set up than I am willing to do and, yeah. and frankly a little bit more horsepower uh, than I need in terms it's it's a pretty robust uh, system there in terms of the how much configuration you can do and remote management and and those sort of things so definitely a a, a good choice for you though and uh, we'll look forward to hearing how that goes I I want to jump into a second particular piece of feedback uh, from Gavin Campbell here second second nod to Gavin on the show uh, we had Gavin on a few weeks ago for a really great installment of the projects project. Uh, Definitely go back and check that out. Episode 201, I believe. Uh, Really, really uh, fun episode. And and he heard our uh, conversation, and he is an Eero uh, Pro Gen 1 user, which we talked about when we had him on. And so he reached out with the following. He said, "Uh, you know, great show on mesh networks. One thing you did mention that caught my attention was that some of these systems rely on cloud connectivity. Uh, something that I had never thought of, about, he says, and and he just assumed that if the internet went down, he'd still have LAN access. So he says, I decided to dig into it deeper, uh, took his Eero Pro Gen 1, and sure enough, if he unplugged his internet modem, uh, the Wi-Fi on the Eero's would turn off until internet access was restored. Uh, so the Wi-Fi completely shutting off if there's no internet connection. He went on to say, I contacted Eero support, and they confirmed this is how it's supposed to work. Uh, included the email, which we'll we'll paraphrase here quickly, uh, and said he's also seen Reddit posts that go into more details. And he says, you know, it does make sense why they do it. Uh, It's just not something I like. So let me, Seth, read this email real quick from support, and then we'll we'll, we'll pick this apart for a second. So uh, support's response was, thanks for reaching out to us here at Eero. Uh, This is normal behavior. Basically, the Eeros are running through the process to self-heal once the wide area network access was lost. Uh, after a length of time, the Eros will reboot, attempting to fix the issue of no internet. Uh, and this is when they drop the LAN access until the WAN is resolved. So there you have it. Really interesting. Yeah, I would say that's not ideal. <laughs> if, no. if your internet's down, I know that, I mean, we had the hurricane here and uh, we eventually got power and power is great. And I had local Wi-Fi, but I didn't have internet for a couple of days. Um, and I know that the Wi-Fi was pretty useless <laughs> at that point uh, until, yeah. you know, you, you really don't uh, realize how much you use of the Internet uh, until you turn it off. Right. Like it's right. It's, it's one of those of things. Yeah. You, you find yourself in a dead zone with your cell phone and you're like, this thing, what does this thing do? It doesn't do anything. So, you know, it's just it's worthless. Useless. Yeah. Paperweight. So but I, I've got to say, um, like it turning off the internal LAN. I, I understand why it's happening, but it seems like there's something that they could do to fix that. It doesn't doesn't sound like an ideal situation to me. 
It it doesn't. You know, you you'd have to think that there would be a way to leave that LAN functionality in place, uh, and then through software monitor that WAN connection and and when that comes back on, you know, fire off a quick reboot to the to the access point so they can re you know refresh. But um, yeah, really, I, I mean, that one is is troublesome for me. I, I don't. I'm not going to call it a deal breaker, but um, you know, it's definitely something I'm considering. Particularly because I'm looking into, I've got a Tableau that I still haven't installed. Um, I just need to figure out the antenna situation and and take care of a couple of other things. Uh, but that Tableau is going to store over the air content on a local hard drive. And as I understand it, the um, Apple TV, the Tableau app, I think, and maybe this is something I, I should dig in and confirm, but I think that app is just going to stream the content that's stored on the Tableau straight across the LAN. I don't see why it would go up uh, to the internet to do that. So that's it's probably something I, I need to confirm. But um, you know that that's one example, right? Where having the LAN functioning without the WAN, without the internet connection, is important. So admittedly, there's not a whole lot of those situations, and mine is a pretty specific use case that I'm thinking through and and trying to weigh my options there. I one thing that I, I think about is the target market for a product like Eero. And I, I go back to all of the times that I've worked directly with clients on on the network. And I'm sure you can relate to this one, Seth. Trying to explain to um, you know a typical client who's not tech savvy and 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 just doesn't take the, you know, doesn't have the background uh, that Wi-Fi and internet are different. Right. I mean, how many times have you tried to have that conversation like with somebody who, who just do, that doesn't resonate with? And I'm just thinking about, you know, a typical user. Uh, if you think through this situation, if the a, a, a typical sort of non tech savvy Eero user has their Internet connection go down, but the LAN stays up. Uh, it's very confusing, probably for them. Right, I, I don't know that it aggravates or makes the situation any worse for the support or the customer experience, uh, but that is something that's interesting to think about. Is for the vast majority of Eero's target uh, customers, the fact is, if the WAN isn't working, the LAN may as well not work either. Uh, frankly, so again, mine is a pretty specific use case, but. Um, these are really the good things to know about. Otherwise, you you go out and maybe you purchase something and uh, you don't quite realize that there's this certain way they handle things that isn't ideal for your setup until uh, you know it's too late or it just causes a big inconvenience. So, uh, really appreciate Gavin digging in and and doing some testing there. It's it's pretty cool. Yeah, when when you said something about the target customer for the Eero, um, I I instantly thought about support and it seems like doing this kind of automates a lot of that support away. Right. Cause exactly. What's the first thing yeah. that you're going to tell a client to do if their internet is working finally after, you know, it being out for a couple hours, but they can't get online they're, You're going to ask them to reboot the router. And that's, <laughs> that's like been automated in this process. And uh, so smart on their part, I suppose. Uh, again, I like, I like, uh, I like what Gavin put here. Uh, it makes sense why they do it, but it's just not something I like. Yeah. And that's kind of my feeling on it as well. But it, at the same time, like I'm thinking of all the stuff I have in my house. The internet's down. I do have the recording, like the Plex server that I could watch TV on. And if I was kind of stuck with a Wi-Fi, like this Wi-Fi being down and it not working, would it be the end of the world that I couldn't watch maybe a recorded uh, video of something, I don't know, maybe an inconvenience a little bit, uh, for about, you know, an hour or two until the internet came back. But other than that, like really not that big of a deal. So, but, but think about, but think about it for a second. Like if you're a cord cutter, for instance, and you have Plex, a local Plex server, like you just mentioned, uh, if your internet goes down, there's actually no more critical a time for your LAN to remain functioning if your kids want to watch a show or yeah. your wife wants to watch a movie and your your only your only option as a cord cutter is to have something stored on the local network. Right. Right. right? And and if if it's an all or nothing deal and the LAN goes down when the WAN goes down, uh, you know, that, that again is a bad deal. I, I wonder if they it, it would seem to me like if they have the ability to activate this, which I can't imagine is a technical limitation. 
uh, why not make it a uh, an option? Why not go into the software and have it be somewhere buried in a more advanced menu where you know people aren't likely to really stumble across it? But if you're so inclined, you can dig in and and say, you know what, um, keep my leave my yeah. WAN in place, and keep the Wi-Fi, and, and I'll deal. <laughs> yeah, like if the I know enough, right? You're you're telling them basically, I know enough to know that the WAN and the LAN are different. And I know that if the WAN goes down, I still want my LAN to work and I can dig in and do some troubleshooting, uh, you know, to figure out what's what later. Yeah. So um, really interesting. I, you know, if anyone, maybe maybe we'll reach out and see if we can get someone from Eero on or if anyone uh, knows anyone at Eero or perhaps works at Eero and is listening, we'd we'd love to hear from you. Uh, feedback at Home Tech. Dot .fm would be a great way to send that across. Yep. Thanks to everybody who participated in our Slack channel, giving us feedback all week, and uh, who submitted to hometech.fm slash feedback. Really appreciate it. Yep, absolutely. Jason, got a big uh, big picture of the week this week. Big one. Big one. You're going to love it. All right. Yeah, so we're, we're trying something new here, Seth. Uh, I have not looked at this ahead of time. Okay, so first time you're going to get my, you're going to get my, uh, my first time reaction here. So the, it's titled "Drywall is not an easy job." Okay. <laughs> Great work, MSP Min- Minneapolis. Is this Minneapolis Airport? Is that but what it, I'm? Yeah, that's what it looks yeah, like. It so it's a be. baggage claim. Yeah, it definitely looks like an airport signage. Comedy art installation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got a uh, a series of oh, baggage claim directories here. So they look like the uh, you know departure or arrival uh, digital signage you see at airports and somebody didn't measure correctly here <laughs> by by at least half a tv <laughs> yeah by by about half a display in uh portrait mode yeah yeah it's uh <laughs> it's a beautiful shot there i i got to say man i i can't imagine doing my job as a drywaller and coming up to this and saying yeah that's that's what i need to do i need to put, yeah. go ahead and fix this <laughs> panel right here and i'll just cut around the tv somebody will come back and patch this yeah, up later you gotta wonder if that's i don't know maybe it's <laughs> temporary or something but <laughs> it's funny you, i could totally see the drywaller coming to that and being like i'm cutting a hole like <laughs> that's it i got a lot of work to do like <laughs> I don't have time for to wait for these AV guys to come take their TVs down. Yeah, details. <laughs> yeah, yep. Yeah. Oh man, that's a good one. Yeah, that's that's a good one. So head over to hometech.fm slash two zero three. Hometech.fm slash two zero three to take a look at that pick of the week as well as all of our show notes from uh from this week's episode. Absolutely. Our email address is feedback at hometech.fm. Join us in the chat room live. Wednesday usually, Tuesday today, but Wednesday usually starting at 7 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern. To find out more about Home Tech Live, go to hometech.fm slash live. Yeah, we would, uh, we'd love to have you there, Seth. We've been keeping them guessing the last couple of weeks. I, I think we may actually be doing a Tuesday recording next week as well. Yeah, uh, I think so. So if you're interested in tuning in, a little bit of flexibility there. We generally do a pretty good job of keeping it to Wednesday evenings. Uh, the time can vary a little bit, but we're on a... A bit of a run here where Tuesday seems to be the day. So if you're interested in tuning in live next week, uh, Tuesday around 7 to 7.30 Eastern, we'd love to have you. Uh, want to also, as we always do, thank our patrons, supporters of the show. Uh, this week, we had Scott McMurray come on as a $5 patron. So he came on at the $5 level. Scott, we really appreciate it. Thank you so much for your support. If you are interested in learning more, uh, if you enjoy the show here, find what we do fun or educational, and hopefully both uh, have a good time listening. We would love your support. Head on over to uh, hometech.fm slash support. Once again, that's hometech.fm slash support. That's where you can learn about supporting our show for as little as a dollar a month. All right, Jason. Well, that wraps up this week. Uh, I think we'll talk to you next week. Yep. Sounds good, Seth. Have a great week. We'll talk soon.